4. The Hermit Mother But all day Snow White was alone, and the kindly dwarves warned her, saying, Watch out for your stepmother. She'll soon find out you're here. Don't let anyone in. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves I want to feel walled in, safe from the predators and their advances to which I have so foolishly succumbed. Flights of fancy take one back to Sandefingham, and a moat enclosed castle. No one must be allowed in. Cynthia was an English teacher who was hesitant about coming to therapy. She shut me out with silence, retreating into the blackness that threatened to consume her. Without reading her journals, I could not have known the depth of her fear. Unlike the waif, whose vulnerability is evident in her flighty, fragile demeanor, the borderline hermit has a hard external shell that is difficult to penetrate. The servile waif relinquishes control too easily, whereas the hermit is terrified of not having control. She can seem self-sufficient, confident, even driven, but her impenetrable exterior is woven with fear, terror laced with hostility. An excerpt from Cynthia's journal illustrates her fear of life. My poem is the life I would have lived, but I would rather write than suffer it. Apologies to D. Thoreau. Cynthia aspired to become an author, but was paralyzed by her fear of rejection. Borderlines who have a gift for writing describe the intensity of their emotional experience in excruciating detail. Sylvia Plath captured the essence of the hermit's inner experience. The only thing to love is fear itself. The hermit trusts fear more than anyone or anything. Fear keeps her alive. Without it, she feels numb, dead. Plath committed suicide in 1963 when she was only 30 years old. Many years earlier, she wrote in her journal, It is so much safer not to feel, not to let the world touch one. Tragically, few people know of the hermit's suffering. Fear prevents her from being seen and from getting help. She keeps herself locked in and locked up. She may dread being photographed and may literally cut herself out of pictures. She avoids groups, hides in the background, and is guarded with others. Only her children and closest confidants are aware of the severity of her unyielding distrust, insecurity, anxiety, rage, and paranoia. Borderline hermits are often writers, artists, scholars, behind-the-scenes characters who are driven and destroyed by fear. Plath wrote, Desperate, intense, why do I find groups impossible? Do I even want them? The hermit is driven to excel and may be outstanding in her field, but is sadly incapable of enjoying her success. If given a choice, however, she may not work at all. The hermit is a perfectionist, a worrier, and like most borderlines, an insomniac. Plath wrote, The dark time. The night time is worst now. Cynthia's anxieties kept her awake at night. She ruminated about the safety of her husband and children, about her job and her health. She held her husband and children to unrealistically high standards and criticized her daughter relentlessly about her grades, her appearance, and her friends. Cynthia's husband retreated from the frequent conflicts that erupted between his wife and his children. The borderline hermit seeks solitude, but paradoxically longs to belong. In social settings, the waif can be inappropriately self-disclosing and too talkative, whereas the hermit is closed, private, and rarely flirtatious. She can be abrupt, but is rarely loud, dramatic, or showy like the borderline queen. The hermit prefers to live and die within the confines of her shell. Exposure feels deadly. The Hermit's Dominant Emotional State Fear The poor child was all alone in the great forest. She was so afraid. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs Like Snow White, the Hermit is extraordinarily vigilant because she felt robbed or violated as a child. Sylvia Plath's father died when she was just eight years old. She wrote, I felt cheated. I wasn't loved but all the signs said I was loved. 
Hermit mothers exhibit paranoid tendencies and typically experienced an early threat to their psychic survival. Needing reassurance but unable to accept it, the hermit lives in fear of domination as well as desertion. Closeness is as threatening as abandonment. The hermit may be superstitious and suspicious of anything that threatens her control. Extraordinarily perceptive, she may believe she is psychic. However, innumerable phobias obstruct her ability to relax, socialize, or enjoy life. Hermit mothers suffer from persistent fantasies of harm coming to themselves or others and tend to attribute hostile intentions to others. Hermits may seem strong to those who do not know them well because, unlike other types of borderlines, they can tolerate being alone. Solitude feels safer than being with others, but does not alleviate anxiety. Cynthia had a generalized fear of authority figures and of groups with power, such as the government. Persecution fears reflected her childhood experience with her own mother, who relentlessly violated her privacy. Cynthia described a tumultuous childhood in which she frequently screamed at her mother, Leave me alone! Hermits want to be left alone, not abandoned, just not bothered. As an adult, Cynthia was unable to tolerate closeness with others because she feared emotional engulfment. Although she could have benefited from anti-anxiety medication, Cynthia was too fearful to use it. She felt safer living in fear, believing that medication would interfere with her ability to perceive danger. Her family begged her to try medication, but she adamantly refused, accusing them of trying to dope her up and stick her in a nuthouse. Like all hermits, Cynthia expected conspiracy, betrayal, and disaster. She accused others, including her husband and children, of not caring about her. She looked for hidden meanings in greeting cards, gifts, invitations, and innocuous comments. The hermit ruminates over questions such as, what did they mean by that? She forms alliances based on conspiracy theories and may spread anxiety like a plague throughout her family. The hermit's relationships fluctuate between it's you and me against the world, and it's you against me. She sees conspiracy everywhere. Managing her internal state consumes the hermit's emotional energy and makes interacting with others feel overwhelming. Hermits dislike entertaining and avoid house guests. Cynthia disapproved of her children's friends and rarely allowed them to visit. Sylvia Plath was evidently horrified by her realization that she was not interested in other people. Ruminating over irrelevant details can seriously impair functioning in social situations. Illogical rules, rituals, and magical thinking fail to protect the hermit from adversity and may in fact jeopardize her well-being. Cynthia could not leave her house without checking and rechecking that the doors and windows were locked. Leaving home was a major ordeal, and the intensity of her anxiety annoyed her children. The hermit's hypervigilance regarding her children's health can leave them without a baseline of normality from which to assess their own well-being. Cynthia's son underreacted to pain as a consequence of his mother's overreaction to every sneeze and sniffle. When injured playing soccer, he avoided telling his mother and minimized his pain. After seeing a doctor several days later, he was surprised to learn that he had broken his foot. The hermit's children may learn to ignore signals of pain from their own bodies. The hermit conceals her distrust, negativity, and low tolerance for frustration by presenting a facade in social interactions. She seeks refuge from the theatrics of life where relationships feel staged. In the social world, she must perform an act merely to survive. Sylvia Plath claimed that socializing required a betrayal of the self. A friend describes Sylvia as, first the bright and smiling mask that she presented to everyone, and then, through that, the determined, insistent, obsessive, impatient person who snapped if things did not go her way, and who flew into sudden rages. Gerald Adler explains that borderlines constantly seek out others to provide a sense of self, to keep separation anxiety relatively in check, to avoid annihilation panic. Unlike other types of borderlines who seek social interaction, the hermit defines her tenuous self through her work, 
her interests or hobbies in a single relationship with an idealized partner or by writing in a journal. Cynthia's success as a teacher was obvious to those who knew her, yet her confidence could be shaken by the slightest mistake. Publishing her outstanding stories felt far too dangerous. Consequently, she protected herself from the possibility of rejection by refusing to submit them. Plath had a great fear of failing academically and intellectually, calling it the worst blow to security. The hermit seeks validation through her work and is therefore extremely conscientious about her performance. Criticism or rejection annihilates the self. Otherwise, there is no I, because I am what other people interpret me as being, and am nothing if there were no people. Although the hermit's behavior seems unnecessarily dramatic and at times ridiculous, her feeling of persecution is genuine. She has no internal mechanism for calming and soothing herself, as her own mother may have functioned both as persecutor and protector. She can find no safe place inside or outside of herself. Her great torment, however, may be that no one understands. She feels alone in the world, lost in herself and her own terrifying thoughts. No one believes her. No wonder she panics. The Inner Experience, Persecution You've got to be careful and not let anyone in when we're away. Snow White The darkness within the borderline hermit is fear. She suffers from acute persecutory anxiety and spends her life warding off a nameless internal predator. She may be convinced that whole groups of people are dangerous or evil, particularly those who do not share her interests or values. Plath once said, I am in love only with myself. Hermits expect to lose what they need. Consequently, they are possessive and controlling. In his poem, Apprehensions, Ted Hughes, Sylvia Plath's husband, described Sylvia's possessiveness. Plath wrote, If anyone ever disarranged my things, I'd feel as though I had been raped intellectually. Indeed, when a friend penciled some passages in a book she had borrowed from Plath, she brought down the wrath of the avenging angel. Family members often mistake the hermit's possessiveness as selfishness, rather than understanding that the hermit feels violated when others move or borrow personal objects. Finding and protecting her own space, her own place, and her own things is a way of protecting herself. Cynthia depicted the hermit's fear that others will take what is hers. This is mine. This is mine. This is mine. The monkey's hard, sharp nails scraping the floor to pick up and greedily hoard for herself what you cannot give her, or what you do give her, but could take away. Because the hermit is afraid of losing herself, she jealously guards her personal belongings. The hermit mother cannot tolerate being exposed. Sylvia Plath's husband stated, I never saw her show her real self to anybody. What cannot be seen cannot be lost or taken. Cynthia wrote to her journal, Only you know me. Like many hermits, both Sylvia and Cynthia punished those they love by shutting them out. When hermits are angry, they confront family members with a wall of cold, stony silence or unbridled wrath. According to a friend, Plath had a way of generating a climate of guilt where none whatsoever was justified. Plath acknowledged, I suppose I'll always be over-vulnerable, slightly paranoid. Although the hermit fears being engulfed by others, she engulfs her family members with her fear and desperation. When they try to separate, even momentarily, the hermit can become enraged. Plath wrote, I am superstitious about separations from Ted, even for an hour. I think I must live in his heat and presence, for his smells and words, as if all my senses fed involuntarily on him, and deprived for more than a few hours I languish, wither, die to the world. Cynthia rarely acknowledged the murderous rage that could well up within her. Plath, on the other hand, described it vividly. I have a violence in me that is hot as death blood. The hostility of the hermit may take the form of biting sarcasm, belligerence, unreasonable demands, temper tantrums, pouting, or stony silence. 
accusations of betrayal, neglect, or abandonment may follow minor misunderstandings. The hermit rarely acknowledges mistakes or apologizes for inappropriate behavior. The survival instinct prevails when the self is endangered. For the hermit, it is a case of self-defense, and she sees herself as innocent of wrongdoing. The misery of the hermit's life is that solitude is not enjoyed, and vigilance never ends. Although she dreads being seen by others, the last thing she wants to see is herself. Very few hermit mothers can tolerate being seen by a therapist. Characteristics of the hermit mother Is possessive and over-controlling The hermit mother's over-controlling and possessive parenting style can paralyze her children. Smothered by the intense, symbiotic relationship, children may feel frozen with fear or driven toward danger by defiant resentment. Hermit mothers often overprotect the all-good child and denigrate the no-good child. The no-good child may be constantly harassed by the mother's negative, paranoid projections. Relentless criticism of the no-good child's appearance, friends, school performance, and personal habits are projections of the hermit's own shame and disgrace. The hermit may cling desperately to the all-good child, seeking allegiance and alliance in the denigration of her husband or the no-good child. The all-good child may feel guilt-ridden and torn due to the hermit's expectation of total loyalty. Because the child's need for autonomy is experienced as betrayal, the hermit's children may feel trapped by her fear. Her adult children may experience physical symptoms related to anxiety. Patients who grow up with hermit mothers frequently report attacks of colitis or nausea, bouts of illness, headaches, muscle tension, or general malaise. Memories of childhood trauma are repressed, and pain is expressed in their bodies. Adult children of hermits may suffer from panic attacks, claustrophobia, or agoraphobia without recognizing the source of their fear, the early experience of feeling trapped by their mothers. Avoids groups and is reclusive. Hermits, by definition, are introverts, whereas borderline waifs and queens are extroverts. Plath wrote, I talk to myself and look at the dark trees, blessedly neutral. So much easier than facing people, than having to look happy, invulnerable, clever. Unfortunately, the hermit mother pulls her children into her protective shell, where she raises them in darkness, believing she is protecting them from danger that only she perceives. The naturally curious child, however, wants to explore the world and therefore threatens the mother's security. The hermit mother may thwart the child's strivings toward independence, socialization, and autonomy. The hermit believes she is helping her children by secluding them from a dangerous world. Adolescents who long for freedom and independence may resist and resent being overprotected. Some adult children of hermit mothers report that they delayed obtaining their driver's license because of their mother's anxiety. A driver's license represents an enormous leap toward independence and provides the ability to get away. Naturally, the hermit's anxiety is more intense when her children become adolescents. Fears rejection more than abandonment. Abandonment may be more tolerable than rejection for the hermit because of her ability to tolerate aloneness, Rejection is devastating because it represents failure. Fear of rejection was the major obstacle in Cynthia's life. She was ashamed and afraid of her need for approval. Her fictional stories represented parts of herself, like Emily the Spider, who was ridiculed for wearing four pairs of glasses. Although the fear of rejection kept Cynthia from submitting her stories for publication, Sylvia Plath was obsessed with being published. Art is an expression of the hermit's inner experience, and rejection can trigger emotional disintegration. Professional success offers comfort, as well as a deeply needed source of pride. Sylvia Plath wrote 30 poems the month after her husband left her. The last poem she wrote prior to committing suicide was about the death of a woman who wore the proud smile of accomplishment. The title of the poem reveals her awareness of how close she was to the edge. The borderline hermit's fear of rejection makes her difficult to help. Treating the hermit can be agonizing, 
because of the risk of premature termination and suicide. For the hermit, suicide may feel like a victory rather than defeat, the last act of free will. She must have control of her death as well as her life, and may leave treatment just as she begins to trust her therapist. Trust is dangerous. Regrettably, suicidal hermits are likely to succeed in killing themselves. They have no desire to reveal their intentions to others and therefore do not threaten suicide. They fear the loss of control that accompanies hospitalization. Without intervention, the tale of the hermit mother may not end with a happily ever after. Ruminates excessively. Daniel Paul explains that feelings can be so overwhelming for borderlines that they have difficulty containing affect. In Sylvia Plath's case, her journal entries, poetry, and short stories depict her flood of emotions. I am drowning in negativism, self-hate, doubt, madness, and even I am not strong enough to deny the routine, the rote, to simplify. No. I go plodding on, afraid that the blank hell in the back of my eyes will break through. The hermit fears the darkness within her, perhaps more than she fears life itself. The hermit's ruminations reflect the toxicity of her own thoughts. She searches for something she is afraid to find, the source of her torment, the cause of her pain. She is sick with worry and full of adrenaline. Cynthia complained that her children and husband ignored her constant warnings. Her children groaned and sighed. It's always something. They teased her about the panic of the day that could be triggered by a harmless comment from a colleague and could set her off for a week. They're trying to get rid of me, she argued. But her husband's reassurance was met with hostility. You never believe me. Just wait and see. The hermit castigates herself mercilessly for minor or invented infractions. Her inner chaos may be evident in a home cluttered with stacks of old newspapers, magazines, and unfinished projects. Her anxiety is too diffuse to be managed and she therefore may focus on one inconsequential object that becomes the target of her shame. Cynthia was embarrassed when an uncle stopped in unexpectedly because she had left a dirty hairbrush in the bathroom. Her husband laughed when she told him how ashamed she felt and asked, Do you really think he even noticed? Out of all the mess around here, why do you care about a hairbrush? The dirty hairbrush represented the shame she felt compelled to hide. Tragically, the hermit cannot be appeased, calmed, or reassured. She is convinced that no one else understands the seriousness of her concerns. The hermit suffers from basic distrust and is destined to feel alone. Is intensely jealous. Because the hermit suffers from basic mistrust and intense jealousy, she may be unable to sustain long-term relationships. A friend of Plath's initially admired her, but later was amazed when Sylvia defended her possessions with a rapacity that, in the end, injured their friendship. Cynthia alienated colleagues by her unwillingness to share information regarding resources, by not attending social functions, and by segregating herself. She guarded her lesson plans as though they contained classified information. Her coldness was interpreted as snobbishness, and some colleagues resented her, not realizing they had intimidated her. Both Cynthia and Sylvia were intensely jealous of their husband's relationships with other females. Plath's friend Dido Merwin wrote, Even the suggestion of Ted's going anywhere with anyone automatically triggered abreactions, great or small, which went double if the anyone was a woman. Biographer Anne Stevenson states, There is evidence that outsiders found Sylvia difficult to know, perverse in her habit of keeping her husband to herself, sometimes unreasonable to the point of rudeness in her dealings with friends and family. Cynthia accused her husband of infidelity despite having no evidence to support her belief. She accused him of not finding her attractive, of rejecting her sexually, and of preferring younger women. On one occasion, she threw a pan at him and later accused him of walking out on her, refusing to acknowledge the possibility that leaving was an act of self-protection rather than abandonment. The hermit's jealousy can lead to destructive and vindictive behavior. When Plath's husband was late returning from lunch with a female BBC producer, 
Her paranoia led her to believe that a person she had never met would make the first inevitable breach in her perfect marriage. The event is described in Hugh's poem, The Minotaur. While Hughes was meeting on business, Plath became hysterical and destroyed his manuscripts, as well as his favorite book, The Complete Works of Shakespeare, in a vicious display of unbridled rage, irrational jealousy, and paranoia. Hughes later confided in a friend that the incident was a turning point in their marriage. Biographer Stevenson states, Yet nothing had happened to harm her marriage other than her upsurge of jealousy is acutely perceptive. The acuity of the hermit's senses results from her intense fear. Because she lives in a state of alarm, she notices things that others miss. Cynthia had a generalized fear of taking in, of being contaminated, and developed rituals to ward off danger. Family members teased her about decontaminating her dishes and eating utensils. She ate only at restaurants where plastic, disposable utensils were used, and where she could see the food being prepared. When a local restaurant temporarily closed after several customers became ill with hepatitis, Cynthia's belief in her rituals intensified. Paranoid thoughts were exacerbated whenever they were reinforced by reality. The hermit's vigilance may be a consequence of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Due to childhood trauma that left her with fear, the hermit's mind seems to be wired to misperceive danger. She may be suspicious of the psychiatric profession and refuse to seek help. A friend explained that of all the characteristics of Sylvia Plath's personality, the saddest of all was that she saw help as a threat, something to be avoided. May be superstitious. Superstitious beliefs include magical thinking or the use of rituals to reduce fear and anxiety. A friend of Plath's made a sculpture of her head which the superstitious Sylvia, like a savage guarding her soul, was in terror of throwing away. Objects representing the self carry special significance for borderlines because their self is unstable and prone to disintegration. Plath and her husband eventually hid the clay head in a willow tree where it could not be found or disturbed. Cynthia's family viewed her rituals as harmless annoyances, but resented her perception of bad omens. Vacations had been canceled or rescheduled on numerous occasions because Cynthia had a bad feeling about the trip. She insisted that her husband retract an offer on a new home after she learned that the previous owner had died suddenly of a heart attack. She was certain that the house was marked with bad luck. Hermits may have lucky numbers. Plath's was 49. Magic colors with special powers or symbols that hold special meaning. Many borderlines use the heart symbol instead of writing the word heart in letters and journals, perhaps to bring good luck or ward off bad luck. Hughes described Plath's habit of painting little hearts on personal belongings in his poem, Totem. The use of magic numbers and symbols reduces anxiety by giving the hermit a sense of control over her environment. Overreacts to pain and illness. Although all borderlines are prone to hysterical reactions when stressed, the hermit feels particularly threatened by illness. She is intolerant of discomfort, inconvenience, and pain. She may moan and groan, scream and cry primarily out of fear, not pain. When frightened, she becomes hostile. Her exaggerated responses confuse those who care for her. In his poem, Fever, Ted Hughes questioned whether or not his wife was crying wolf in her bout with food poisoning. The hermit may react with equal hysteria to stubbing a toe and breaking a bone. Because she may overreact to physical pain and illness, family members may be unable to distinguish minor injuries from major emergencies. Overreaction to pain or illness is a consequence of the hermit's inability to soothe or comfort herself. When she feels vulnerable, she is incapable of containing anxiety. Responding with ridicule or minimizing her complaints merely increases her anxiety. Cynthia's son ignored her physical complaints. Her daughter, however, felt compelled to take care of her. The all-good child often comforts the hermit, serving the role of the parentified child. Uses food, alcohol, and sex to self-soothe. 
The hermit may use food, alcohol, or sex to reduce anxiety. She is less likely than the queen to self-soothe by spending money, as she is not inclined to attract attention to herself. Although she may have expensive tastes, prefer gourmet meals, fine china, or high-quality items, spending money is not generally gratifying because it threatens her security. The hermit is most likely to abuse food, alcohol, or sex when feeling rejected. The absence of the borderline's partner triggers the hermit's need for self-soothing. At those times, the hermit may develop paranoid thoughts and feelings of desperation and may use any available coping mechanism to reduce her anxiety. Sylvia Plath wrote in her journal, Let me not be desperate and throw away my honor for want of solace. Let me not hide in drinking and lacerating myself on strange men. Before marrying her husband, Cynthia had many casual sexual relationships. A journal entry read, I feel dead, flat. Instead of being horrified and ashamed at my throwing myself at another man last night, I feel, thankfully I guess, a strange void. Gunderson describes levels of functioning that correspond to the status of the borderline's primary relationship. If the person to whom she is most attached is perceived as supportive, the borderline is generally mildly depressed and angry with herself. When she perceives her partner as frustrating, the borderline is angry, manipulative, and devaluing. When the partner is absent, the borderline becomes panicky, impulsive, and possibly psychotic. Evokes guilt and anxiety in others. The hermit mother often uses guilt to control others. After separating from her husband, Sylvia Plath asked to stay with a male companion. Her friend politely explained why, in his small community, it would be inappropriate for her to stay with him. He later recalled that her reaction made him feel guilty, leaving him thinking that he had been mean. Other friends recalled Plath's tendency to corner people and leave them feeling afraid to act on their true feelings. Plath's friend Dido Merwin stated, any first-hand evidence of the effect Sylvia had on people must reveal something about the flawed psyche that made her not so much her own worst as her only enemy, a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. The hermit unconsciously projects her anxiety in a variety of ways. Borderlines who have suicidal tendencies evoke powerful feelings of guilt and fear in family members, as well as in therapists. Sorting out the factors leading to suicide is not easy. Some hermit mothers never attempt or threaten suicide because their fear of dying is as intense as their fear of living. Others may grow weary of feeling constantly threatened and may decide that dying, paradoxically, is the ultimate act of protecting oneself from the dangers of living. The borderline hermit is her own worst enemy and is the single greatest threat to her survival. The Hermit Mother's Motto, Life is Too Dangerous. Life can be dangerous, but the Hermit Mother teaches her children that life is overwhelmingly dangerous. The Hermit's fears are projected onto her child and introjected, taken in as real to the child. Consequently, her children may become accustomed to high levels of anxiety, feeling normal only when they feel anxious. In some cases, the hermit's children may intentionally seek out dangerous experiences in rebellious defiance of her negative messages. Others may protect her, sensing her vulnerability and fear, and thus suffer from acute separation anxiety and guilt. The hermit's emotional message that life is too dangerous can undermine the child's self-confidence. The child may be deprived of important opportunities to explore the world, to make mistakes, and to learn from experience. Recognizing risks in any given situation is essential for survival. However, the hermit's children may be unable to discern appropriate from neurotic anxiety. An anxious child has difficulty concentrating in school, sleeping at night, forming relationships, and achieving developmental goals. The hermit's children learn to be afraid without understanding what it is they fear. Overwhelming or pervasive anxiety can immobilize both the hermit and her child. The hermit mother may homeschool her children because of irrational fears, prevent her children from participating in extracurricular activities, 
or keep them out of school whenever they have the slightest cold or cough. Children may receive the message that they do not have the ability to cope with life. Messages from the Hermit Mother Something terrible just happened. You're going to get hurt. Look out! You've done it now. Don't tell anybody. They're out to get us. Keep your doors locked. What's the matter with you? Act like everything's fine. Don't let them in. In searching for memory, the brain, the mind, and the past, Daniel Schachter explains that the amygdala triggers secretion of norepinephrine, which makes the senses more alert, but leaves the individual feeling edgy. The borderline hermit is always on edge. She hears noises that others do not hear, is overly sensitive to smells, and is acutely perceptive of her environment. She never feels safe. Like Emily the Spider, in her short story, Cynthia's favorite place to hide was her basement. The warmth from her iron, the sound of the washing machine, and the absence of daylight gave her a sense of security. The hermit's adult children may become the focus of her social life. Her few friends are typically individuals who are also anxious and insecure. Holidays can be particularly difficult for her and her family because of the need for increased socialization. Thus, children of hermits often find holidays disappointing and depressing. The hermit mother may raise waif daughters, women who relinquish control too easily, and angry, aggressive sons who expect to be attacked. Sadly, few hermits have the courage to seek treatment. Those who do, however, are likely to stop when they begin to trust the therapist. They seem to catch themselves with their guard down after revealing some part of themselves that felt too shameful. Their shame is initially apparent in their avoidance of eye contact, then later in their total withdrawal from treatment. The hermit mother's fear is truly incomprehensible to others. She spins an invisible web that protects her against intruders, but can paralyze her children. Tragically, she may live and die in the sticky strands she weaves.